I do have my name is Rosie and I work with Helen at Kit Parkinson's um, and we're going to talk to you um, about a few trials that are in the pipeline or actually already going um, that are based on the lysosome function. So this is very much not my area of expertise but I'll just give you a very brief top line overview of what this is based on. Flip through to the next one. So the lysosomal system is essentially the dustpan and brush of the cell. So it plays a very important role in cleaning out any waste products to ensure that the cell can keep functioning as normal. Um, when you have increases of proteins like alpha cyanucleotide um, accumulating in Parkinson's, um, this may cause lysosomal dysfunction, um, which stops the, this waste clearing process happening as normal. Um, <laughs> um, so one enzyme or protein that is involved in this process is known as glucocerebrosidase or it really tips off, <laughs> off the tongue on that one. Yeah, or more easily GKs. Um, and GK is, is encoded for or produced by this gene called GBA1, which you may well have heard of as a, sort of a risk gene in Parkinson's. So people with Parkinson's who have this mutation in the GBA1 gene um, have decreased levels of GKs activity. So this enzyme isn't working as well. There's less waste clearance from the cell and that causes that propagating dysfunction. Um, and they also have an increased risk of Parkinson's. And people with Parkinson's without the mutation, the GB1 gene, interestingly, have also shown the same decrease in GK's activity. Um, so it's, of course, important to explore whether this could be a therapeutic target, something to target um, in clinical in trials. Um, and also if GK's levels could potentially be measured and used to show if these drugs are having an effect. So we're going to go on now to talk a few, about a few projects that we're looking at. Um, Helen, do you want to do that one? Uh, why don't you do this one? Okay, um, so um, PD Frontline, I know a little bit more about because this is a project that we're funding at Cure Parkinson's. So this is part of the Rhapsody study that's being run out of UCL. Um, what they do is offer a home genetic testing kit. So they send you a saliva kit, you sign up. This is just based in the UK at the moment. Um, you take the saliva kit, you send it back to them. They run all the tests and they tell you if you have a, either a GBA or a LARP2 um, mutation. Um, PD generation, I believe, is a very similar concept. It is, um, although there's there's a lot more genetic counselling and things. I, has anyone taken part in PD generation? I, I had a feeling, Dan and Ginny, um, you get genetic counselling as part of that, don't you? Um, and it's a very formal system. But I think um, I think PD generation, I think, is a fantastic, fantastic resource for for this side of the <coughs> pond, particularly because they're now expanding into. Um, Colombia and Venezuela and, and you know, other South American countries. So we're starting to map genetics globally because for too long research has been happening in Europe or in North America. And we actually need to see Parkinson's research happening globally because not everybody's Parkinson's is the same. And actually already just a, just a month or so ago at the recent movement disorders meeting, they were reporting new genetic findings that were coming through from the GP2 consortium and um, particularly from Africa and, and you know that genetic data collection could be giving us clues for research so it's a very brilliant way of getting involved in research because it means that you're sharing your data openly and with that we're helping to inform other research programs going forward. Oh, okay so we're now going to talk about two drugs that are going into trial this one is a, um, a drug that has been developed by uh, initially by a company called Lysosomal Therapeutics that was based over in, Bos in Boston. Um, and this is looking at phase two. So it, uh, it was acquired by a, a Portuguese company called BL Pharmaceuticals. Um, and they, they started their trials, first of all, in March this year. What they're looking for is 237 people with Parkinson's who have got a GBA mutation. Um, so they want those people to have been diagnosed within the last seven years. They need to be stable on medication and they need to have a honan yar score of less than 2.5. Now, there's a very good reason I put that honan yar score in there because that is the current staging system that's used for Parkinson's. If, in a couple of years' time, we are able to say that we'll have an effect on the GBA gene as measured biologically, you can see how suddenly this is going to become very much more precise rather than relying on a honan yar score which is a clinical score if we're able to say we have a biological readout for a trial rather than a clinical readout 
that could be transformative, particularly for these types of targeted medications. So all the talk about staging yesterday, even though we were focusing on um, alpha-synuclein and we were focusing on loss of, loss of dopamine, the genetic targets also come into play here. And actually, if we can have a biological readout for a trial that's involving a genetic cohort of people, that will give us a much more precise readout for the trial rather than relying on a clinical test, which is going to involve this and this and walking up and down and all of that. Um, so really important to include that. So the duration is 18 months treatment with one month of follow up. The endpoint is efficacy, safety, tolerability, pharmaco dynamics, pharmacokinetics, which is, a bit, I still can't say any of that either, um, around two different doses of the drug. So it's the trial is going to be structured with one placebo arm and then one dose arm and then a second dose arm. And what they're actually going to be looking at for is a delay in meaningful clinical progression on MDS, UPDRS 2 and 3. Um, this is going to be happening in Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Spain, the UK and the US. Um, it's a drug that we actually followed through the International Link Clinical Trials Program a few years ago, and it was highly prior prioritised. Uh, we were absolutely thrilled that it then was picked up by BL, who then have given it the investment to move it forward. And we really, really hope that they are very successful. Um, but again, this is at phase two. It's at a more exploratory level, um, and it is only involving people with GBA Parkinson's. So their first job is, is to verify and involve and recruit people with GBA Parkinson's as that first stage and then involve them in the, in the therapeutic arm later. Um, and then in the UK, we have a phase three, which is the final clinical stage uh, of testing that, that um, Sean so kindly was explaining earlier, um, of a drug called Ambroxol. Now this is the ASPRO PD study. Um, studies come up with lots of really interesting names. This one is Ambroxol to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease, hence ASPRO PD. Um, you can see Tony Shapiro here is our lead investigator. Um, we are looking at this generic, um, so old drug that is used to reduce um, uh, in the lungs and it's used as a cough mixture very widely across Europe. <clears throat> However, it's not used here in the US or Canada or Australia or in the UK, which is actually quite, it's, it's positive because it means we can create a market for it. It's a negative in that we've got to bring in the drug, package it, and sort it out, and that, that takes a bit of extra work. We're going to be involving 330 people with Parkinson's, half of whom we would very much like to have GBA, GBA1. Uh, we want people to be aged between 40 and 75 years. And again, we would like people to be diagnosed within seven years, Hone and Yar, 1 to 2.5. Again, we're back to this clinical staging of Hone and Yar, which doesn't mean anything very much to anyone. And we would very much rather have a biological readout. Um, so, we will be treating people for two years um, and then there will be a six month extension where everybody will see, receive the drug. Um, we're looking at this at a very, very high dose. And this has been one of our big challenges with this project because um, it's easy to buy the cough mixture, um, but you would have to be drinking really rather a lot of it every day. And that really would not be very kind on everybody. So one of the things that our regulator in the UK requested that we did is that we compress the dose which we've managed to do, and we're just working through the final stages of that now. So that it, instead of having 21 pills a day, which we had in the pilot study, we'll be down to just three a day in addition to people's Parkinson's meds. Big one. Um, <laughs> I hope they're not horse pills. I really do hope they're not horse pills, but I think they are um, sort of fairly normal size. I, I, I think they don't taste very nice. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so the challenge has actually been how to make the placebo not taste very nice either. <laughs> so, you know, some of these things I didn't know I was going to know about, but you do now. Um, so again, what we're looking at here is a, is a clinical readout, because with phase three, they do need to see that clinical change as well as the biochemical change. Um, however, one of the things that we are including in this study, and it is going to be burdensome for participants, is an optional lumbar puncture study. Um, because we want to understand how that drug is interacting in the brain. And the only way we can do that is by taking a draw from a spinal fluid, um, which is, is going to be a, um, uh, a way of mirroring what's going on in the brain. 
So we do have, have that included. But with that, we can run a whole lot of chemical tests to see how the drug is working in cells, see whether it is potentially lowering alpha subnuclein levels, um, and also seeing whether it, uh, it is having any other effect within, within, the, um, within the fluids. So really quite a, uh, an important part of this study is proving the biochemistry. Um, but also I think being able to compare the biochemistry in the cohort of people with GBA versus the cohort of people who do not have GBA, because hopefully this will be a therapeutic for everybody, but actually knowing if there is a difference between those two groups would be helpful. <coughs> Is that the last slide? Yeah. Oh, well done. My computer's really having a play up at the moment. Ah. There's also a gene therapy approach that's looking at GBA. Um, now, gene therapies are very complicated. Um, this is a single dose, um, and it's it it's surgical. Dose goes in through through brain surgery. Um, and I think that gene therapies are potentially hugely exciting, but this is a very early field for Parkinson's. And I think we don't know enough about uh, being able to turn the genes off if we need to, for example. Um, so all of these are, are very much uh, early, early, early phase one trials at this point. Um, but this is, this is one that is absolutely targeting people with GBA with the hope of actually being able to modify that mutation. Um, so it is delivering a healthy copy of the GBA into cells, um, and it's being studied in a phase in three phase one. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, so actually, it is moving forward, but moving forward very slowly. And so we're still waiting for some safety readouts on that. But it does show that. Yeah. Does the does the placebo group get a? Well, I, I don't know enough about that. I, for the last time I really picked up on the prevail studies, they were only treating, they, they only had a treatment, active treatment arm. They didn't have a placebo controlled okay. arm. Um, and I think that that whole discussion around sham surgery is something that we are really aware of, particularly having had the growth factor trials happening. And, and so, you know, trying to find a way of um, understanding Hang on, I'm going to just pause on that for a second, because um, when you've got any form of surgical trial, you get a very much stronger placebo response, which is a real challenge. So if you have a placebo arm and an active treatment arm in a surgical trial, trying to then mitigate the effects of that is very hard. And I think that our view is it would be much more helpful if regulators would allow us to have a natural history arm rather than a, a sham surgery arm, for example, or a natural history arm rather than a placebo arm. Um, and perhaps the only way we're going to be able to prove that is for a trial or so, have a natural history arm, a placebo arm and an active arm, and then be able to compare the difference between the placebo arm and the natural history arm. Because if we are able to be able to compare the the placebo effect that the placebo group have between those two, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, however, it is something that we are battling with as we move forward. The other thing, gene therapy, to me, that would be a more, so if you're doing a trial there, it's, it's a more permanent exactly. shot. Exactly. I mean, whereas in a drug therapy, you know that eventually this washes out. You, and that's, so that's what that's I was different. trying to explain about having the on-off, which yeah. we don't have yet. So. It is a very exploratory, very emergent field. But I think that um, there's a lot of learning going on from other disease areas and that will really help. Just touching on number functions because they are an important topic and they have been an important topic over, over the last day or so. Um, you know, the blood brain barrier is there to stop things getting into the brain. So we have to find a different way of seeing what is happening in the brain. And unfortunately, the only way we can do that is with a number puncture. Um, it is allowing us to collect really important information. It does allow us to develop biomarkers. It's, it's a way of picking up change that imaging might be following on behind. Um, so change might be happening biologically, but we might not be able to pick it up through brain imaging. Um, so, and it also will happen at a different rate to clinical change. And we've seen that in a number of trials where actually we've had biochemical change, we've had imaging change, but no clinical change because there might be a clinical lag. 
So I think it's making sure that we pick up as much information from wonderful participants when we have them in trials, seeking their consent, making sure we can collect all samples that we can if they're willing to do so, because it helps us to move this forward. And if we can end up with biological measures, that's really helpful. Um, however, this is something we are now doing some work on because we really want to understand how often is, is it acceptable to have a number culture and also, um, you know, what other information is needed to give people confidence to take part in number culture, culture studies. So, um, yeah. Hello. Is it, is it an opt-in, opt-out? Or yeah, absolutely. In the UK, it's always an opt-in, opt-out. Um, but it is and because, in again, in the UK, we have... Um, Research tends to be run through the specialist centres, particularly if you're doing any biological measures. So with that, you have specialists who are doing this. Um, you, it's not you're expected to pop up on the couch at your GP and then have a, have a lunch. Lunch. No, it is done with a great deal of thought and care and all the pros and cons are really carefully explained. I think that really might be the last one. Oh, no. <laughs> Over to you. So, Rosie. <laughs> so, this is a little bit of a rehash from last year, so I'm sorry if I'm probably repeating myself a lot, but as we just discussed this morning, clinical trial participation is uh, is a big subject, um, and how do we get more people to get involved um, and to recruit to trials more easily? And so, last year, and many of you will remember, we did a survey looking at the barriers most status facilitated for taking part in research, and what I wanted to focus on uh, partially is the benefits that people um, reported to have experienced, um, and a lot of these, as um, as we discussed a lot yesterday, please feel free to jump in, is that they are um, tend to be the more altruistic uh, benefits that you can do part of research for other people's benefits rather than necessarily the benefit of the intervention itself. However, having said that, um, people that have taken part in research, you'll see on the left hand side, the trial experience group, they're still motivated by the intervention. You can see in the second uh, second highest motivator there. But just to, to outline a little bit, some of the barriers that people see to taking part in research tend to be the more physical more physical side effects, so um, things like brain surgery, of course, and the uh, risk of side effects, um, things like lumbar punctures, more invasive procedures. Um, and this can be um, facilitated uh, in different ways. But one of the things that really comes out, and it came out a lot in the survey, a lot of different <laughs> questions, is the importance of communication. So understanding what you're signing up to, understanding the consent, the data privacy, and you know, all the uh, procedures that you might go through. Um, so choosing a clinical trial, this is a question that in my role I get asked a lot, how to choose a clinical trial. Um, what I would say is the first step is to always talk to your Parkinson's specialist if you see one, um, or your doctor, your GP, whoever you're seeing, um, and ask questions. Um, sometimes it's difficult to know what questions to ask, but if you go with a list and find out um, exactly what each trial would be. Uh, would contain. Um, looking up opportunities online in the US, the Fox Trial Finder is an incredible resource. Um, and talk mm -hmm. to other people with Parkinson's, maybe people who have trial experience, talk to family, friends, um, so you can find an opportunity that's right for you. And that really is it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Just wondering, the um, barriers to participating trial, do you by any chance have diversity data behind it? So um, we have very little diversity data in this trial. It was in this survey, sorry, uh, it was uh, in English, done online, very long survey, um, so through um, not the widest uh, portals. So we had um, very narrow respondents, although we had lots of respondents who we were very grateful for. There was very, there was very much diversity. And it you, is did, some... you did collect the diversity, but unfortunately it wasn't very Oh, narrow. exactly, exactly, exactly. Data, yes, we did collect, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but again, this is something that we're really keen to, to move on with. As a, and I think when EJS kicks off, because that has got a very uh, inclusive approach to the way it's going to be recruiting participants, and we're going to be seeking people from all walks of life in the UK, it, it, we hope you'll be able to pick up more of that data. Alicia. I just want to make a comment to people in the room, because they don't see the results of research. And in my career, I have seen diseases cured in my lifetime when the job I have done and it's pretty amazing and I've seen research done at the bedside and we've cured things and it's pretty cool so um I there there will be results that people can see from this and I think it's pretty cool to see that so it happens people it does happen and also, if it's anything that's, that we funded, uh, we, we kind of are rather fierce about it to make sure the results do come back to the participants and that we create an opportunity for people to do this. So, um, 
<clears throat> the GPA one study that you talked about a little bit ago with the I noticed that's in includes the US, correct? Yes. And do you have any idea would that be accessible in Michigan? Or I don't I haven't looked to see exactly where the centers were, um, but I can I can look look that up and, and send you a link. Okay. And you do need to, to follow, include you need to have the GBA. Uh, but that study you would need to have GBA yeah. Parkinson's. And you can find that out somehow before yeah. bothering to apply. Yeah. Brilliant. Any other questions? Fantastic.